Go. I want to begin by welcoming our guest, Zaidi. Thank you for being here. So wonderful. Uh, the Torah is meant for people who are you're supposed to be learning from the time that you can even start to speak. Before. Even before that, we bring our children into the base medrash. It says that many great Torah sages, their mothers would bring them into the base medrash in their crib, in their strollers, that they would just hear the words of Torah. And just hearing words of Torah would go into their soul. And the Torah is supposed to be learned until 120 years, like Moshe Rabbeinu, Ani Ben Meve Esrim Hayoim. I'm 120 years today. And therefore, I should live until 120 years. <laughs> Bo Hashem. 23 to go. 23 to go. 97 years old, right. here learning Torah with us today. Wow. Unbelievable, wow. right? I was like, maybe like 60s, you know, something like that. Okay, Bo Hashem, we are in Shar Yichd Ve'emunah, and we are learning about the unity of God. Right? Shmuel's just like, we just go right into it. Awesome. Specifically, this entire Sefer is teaching us about the mitzvah of Shema. The mitzvah of Shema is like, you know, pretty Jewish. Shema Yisrael Hashem Elokein Hashem Echad. Shema Yisrael is a constant mitzvah to know that Hashem is one. When we say that Hashem is one, we don't mean that Hashem is one in the category of gods. You know, do you believe that God is one? Of course, you know, like there's only one God. Everybody knows that. But then there's me. Then there's, you know, the matcha I had earlier today. Thank you, Leah. You know, there's God, but then there's a bunch of other stuff. No, that's soft-core monotheism. The Jewish people are into hard-core monotheism, which means God is one. There's nothing but Hashem. We're all inside of Hashem right now. That's already more advanced thinking. And every time that you say Shema Yisrael, you think about that reality. And we've been working on an analogy to help us understand this. And this is going to catapult us into the fourth chapter. The analogy that we've been working with is the analogy of the sun and its rays. So the sun has rays that emerge from the sun. And when you see the rays distant from the sun as they pass through the Earth's atmosphere, you could think that the rays have an independent existence. A ray comes into my window, it comes into another window. But if you are smart and you trace the source of the rays, you realize that the rays are one with the sun themselves. You can't separate the ray from the sun. They only look like they're somehow independent because they're far away from the sun. But I ask you, if the ray shines down here, does the ray also shine on the surface of the sun? Of course, if it can shine down here, certainly it could shine on the surface of the sun. But if I trace the ray back to the sun, will I see the individual ray on the face of the sun? No, it'll be consumed, it'll be absorbed into the source of the ray, the sun itself. The only reason why I recognize the ray is because the ball of the sun doesn't follow the ray down to earth. That's a good thing for us. And I'm able to see that the ray seems distant or separate. But that's just a perspective problem. If I were to trace the ray back to its source, I wouldn't be able to find the ray even though it's there. We are the rays of the sun. Creation are the rays of the sun. It only seems that we're separate from our source because we're far. But that's not true. We're not far. Creation created a perspective of seeming like we're far. But the truth is we are ex we're one with the sun. We're an expansion from the sun. And two parts. Number one, we completely depend on the sun. Otherwise, the ray would not exist. But not just that we come from the sun. If there was no sun, there would be no ray. And then we went one step further. We said that the analogy is not exactly like the reality because in the analogy, the rays can move away from the sun. But in the reality, Hashem is one, which means we're all still on the surface of the sun right now. 
you can't leave the sun. It's just an analogy to help us understand, but the reality is that we're like the rays on top of the sun. Okay, like we said, it's getting a bit hot in here. We're like the rays on top of the sun, and that is the truth of creation. We're the rays on top of the sun. And when you meditate on that, that starts to show you the unity of Hashem, is that Shema is the process of going from being a ray that's far away from the sun to returning, going on the journey back towards your source, which is the sun itself. And in that place, you're like, where am I on the sun? Okay, you, you are there. Like we said, if you shine down here, certainly you shine up in your source. But in your source, you're totally submerged into the sun. Okay, so far so good. Nothing uh, too abstract. We're trying to make it very down to earth. Okay, then we began chapter 4. Chapter 4, we quoted a verse from King David, whom we love. We love David Melech. David Melech is the, the chariot of kingship. David Melech is, is the great leader of the Jewish people. And David Melech says a verse to us. He says the following verse. Ki shemesh umogen Hashem elokin. Shemesh umogen Hashem elokin. There is a sun, and the sun has a magen. A magen means a shield. And the simple meaning of this is that the sun has an ozone layer. The sun has a protective sheath around it. And good thing it has that because if the powers of the sun would be unleashed, it wouldn't be so good for uh, our skin conditions. So good thing that the sun's power is being held back, either by ozone or atmosphere, simple shot. That's called the mugging. And the name that refers to God as the sun is Yudke Vavke. And the name that refers to God as, so to speak, holding back the rays of the sun is Shem Elohim. So far, so good. And then we quoted that the Gemara teaches us that in the time to come, in the days of Mashiach, which feels so close, my friends, so close, it's time to do tshuva now. Tshuva means Hashem. I want to be better. I want to be more honest. I want to be more upright. I want to be... Uh, a noble person, an Ehrlich, an Ehrlich Yid. There's no way to translate that word, Ehrlich. How do you translate Ehrlich, Yiddish? Ehrlich. So much of Yiddish is exactly, ex like, you know, a winkel. A winkel means like a corner. It's a winkel. It's like, Yiddish is what it sounds like. <laughs> it is, you know, like, it just that, that's just the metzius of, of Yiddish. It was, it was a language created out of, like, out of just pure neshama, when our bodies were being like totally uh, squeezed in the crucible. And just Yiddish came out of that. So, the sun is shining, and if there wasn't a shield protecting it, it would be problematic. So the Gemara says, in the end of days, there's going to be a situation where God is going to remove the sun from its sheath. God will, so to speak, allow the sun to shine forth with all its power. And in the end of days, what will happen? It says that the wicked will be consumed by the sun, and the righteous will be healed by the sun. And it's interesting, we said that this week's parsha, Av Mavinu, that Vayera Elov, that Hashem appeared to Avram, and he was sitting in the Pesach of the oil, he was sitting in the, the entryway to his tent, he was sitting outside. Why was he sitting outside? Because he just wanted to guess. But Hashem took the sun out of the sheath, and the sun became very, very strong and powerful, so nobody was showing up. And it says that Avramina was sitting there, and he was third day after his bris milah, and the sun was healing his bris. But I thought the sun was out of the sheath. That's like powerful rays, you know? That's very strong. Now you need like some UV billion, you know, to, to protect from that. Not if you're at tzaddik. 
If you're a tzaddik, when the sun comes out from its protected sheath, it will heal the righteous and the wicked will be consumed by it. I want to tell you an interesting thing. Who here growing up, who here learned about the ten plagues in Egypt? Right? Everybody knows about that, the ten plagues. What was plague number nine? Darkness, Darkness right? So everyone has like the, you know, the books, you know, of Yitzhiz Mitzrayim and the plague of darkness. And, uh, you know, if, if you buy like the Yitzhiz Mitzrayim books and like somewhere in Williamsburg, so it has all the Yidin leaving Mitzrayim and Strimals and Bekishas, you know, <laughs> I'm sure it wasn't exactly like that. But whatever the, you know, it says we left Beresh Gali, we left like noble free people. And by the way, Hashem says, in the same way that you left Egypt, in that way, I will redeem you once again in the days of Mashiach, and I will show you miraculous things. Says the Zoyar, the miracles in the times of Mashiach will be much greater than the miracles of leaving Egypt. Much more powerful. Now we're still t talking about those miracles thousands of years later. 3,300 years later, we're talking about the miracles of leaving Mitzrayim. The miracles of Mashiach will be even, will eclipse those miracles. So back to Makkah number nine. What was the ninth Makkah? Darkness. So you open up the kids' books, and what's the plague of darkness look like? It's like, everything's like dark, and we know Chazal teaches us that whatever position you were in, like, you were like frozen in that position, right? The darkness was so thick, you couldn't, it was like scary. You couldn't see, like, it wasn't, it wasn't even darkness like that. It was so dark. It was a darkness of, like, it penetrated the person. They couldn't move. So you're frozen in that position. But notice it says there in the Pasuk, to the Yidin, Haya Or B'moyshvoysam, to the Jews it was light in their dwelling places. What do you mean? It was dark, but it was light? I thought it was dark, and the Jews had light. So you know what the Zohar says? Do you know what the plague of darkness was? The plague of darkness was God made such a bright light that those that couldn't handle that light, it became dark. It was a blinding light. And those that could handle the light, it was or the Moish Vaisam. The plague of darkness wasn't darkness, it was Ribui Or. It was a tremendous amount of light. Remember we talked about, you go to a shear and it's like too much light? See, so yeah, gotta check my thing, get back on Smash Brothers quick before the rabbi says more Torah. I'm melting. You know, the wicked weed, I'm melting. You know, it's like, the, every classic thing, it gets too light, so the evil just slinks away, back into their holes. The light. Light, if you can't handle it, is blinding. It blinds a person. But if you have the vessels to receive the light, you, uh, all you want is the light. So for the Yidin, that they were going through this purification process in Mitzrayim, when Hashem took the sun out of the sheath, which we'll see in a second, when he started shining Yudke Vavke, he removed Elohim. So the Yidin were like, bring on the Yudke Vavke. And for those that couldn't handle it, it was darkness. It was paralyzing darkness. To meet reality, the truth of reality, Hashem, Ein Oid Milvadai, if a person's been running away from Hashem his whole life, that could be very paralyzing to see the truth. Okay, next move. So now says the Balatanya. Hashem will take the sun, which is Yud Kei Vav Kei, and remove Elohim. What is Elohim? Elohim, like we said yesterday, Elohim is the same numerical value as Ha Teva, nature. Nature is the way that God conceals His light. Because you could get up, you know, get out of bed, brush your teeth, you know, like the beginning of some movie, like Groundhog Day, you know, brush your teeth, you know, go to the fridge, 
grab some cocoa pebbles, milk, head out into your car, welcome day. And everything kind of just looks like business as usual. Oilam kimin hagoi nahug. The world is just running, you know, bederch teva. And you could think that there's no yudke vavke, which we'll see what yudke vavke means in a moment. There's just Elohim. Elohim is God. It's the way that God manipulates nature. But God is using that, i.e. nature, as a way to hold back the power of the sun from scorching the creation. So God, Yudke Vavke, is like the sun, and Elohim is the way that Hashem is like blocking the sun, God's, call it more undiluted energy, from burning up creation. So God cloaks himself. He holds back the rays of the sun using the name Elohim, which means the one who's in charge of the, nat the natural world. Elohim, Gematria 86, which is the same numerical value as nature, sunrise, sunset. Yes, Yankel. Um, isn't Elohim uh, like din, like judgment, like, like harshness? It is. It's like why, it seems like it's a good thing that Elohim is holding it. Oh, so, well, so very good. Who said that din is so bad? This is called chesed shebed din, because if we didn't have Elohim, we'd be burned up by the rays. You need to have a way of, meaning, back to the puzzle, ki shemesh umogen Hashem Elohim. There's a sun, and the sun, good thing it has a magain, good thing it has an ozone layer, good thing it has an atmosphere that the sun's rays don't burn us up. Yudke Vavke is very powerful. Remember, if you want to charge your phone, you don't go to the nuclear power plant and plug it into the reactor. It wouldn't be so good for the phone. Even though you, you want juice, you want a quick charge, you know, pump this thing up. So go right to the source. No, good thing you downgrade the energy to the point where you could put it into the socket and it's a level of energy that you can connect to. So Yudke Vavke, undiluted, is very, very powerful. By the way, when you say Shema, you actually can go back into the nuclear reactor. You only do that twice a day, three times. Because that's a lot of energy. But you know what we're going to be doing for infinity? You're going to be journeying back into the reactor. It's going to be exciting, my friends. You know, we have long, I would say, you, we want to make friends like, you know, like long-term relationships. Like we're preparing for long-term relationships, you know, eternity. Like this is a very long-term relationship that we're developing here. And you're going to be journeying back into, use the analogy that will help you, nuclear reactor, into the, the surface of the sun, Wh whichever one, you know, uh, imagine getting like a thousand miles from the sun, like, what do you look like then? <laughs> and then, okay, 9,000, now this is all just an analogy, but, and Hashem is, the sun is like black compared to, to Hashem, it's just an analogy. So imagine going into that level of energy, forever. It's exciting times that are coming, okay? But good thing in this world, Hashem uses the name Elohim, Din, to hold back the energy in order to allow for free will to develop. That God holds back that light and creates nature allows for us to have free will. If God took away Elohim, there wouldn't be much free will. You would see the light. Okay? Let's go into Yudke Vavke for a few minutes. Because first the Rebbe is going to describe Yudke Vavke, the sun. Then he's going to, to describe essentially Tzimtzum, how God conceals the light to allow for creation to develop. In chapter 6 he's going to tell us why Elohim is the name for that. But for now he's actually just going to go into a whole explanation of the energy that God uses to create the world and then the energy that God uses to hold back the light from burning us all up. In other words, he's going to describe the nature of the nuclear power plant. Then he's going to describe the nature of using transformers 
to hold back the energy, to, to downgrade it, to allow for a relationship and a usable connection to the source of the energy, i.e., plug in a lamp to enjoy the, enjoy the pleasant... Uh, I, I was in a shop today. Uh, a Himalayan salt crystal lamp. So it's very pleasant, but it's become a popular thing. Uh, you want to plug in your Himalayan salt crystal lamp, and it's very nice, very pleasant. So you can't plug the lamp into the nuclear reactor. But let's say you say like, oh, what a downgrade. Like, I want to experience. So don't do this, but if you put your finger in the socket, you'll, you'll taste a little bit of the reactor. You'll, you'll taste it, you know what I'm saying? Elohim is holding back it. It's interesting, energy is something that is a hard thing to define. What is it? Potential. What's potential? Energy. What is energy? Which is interesting that the Kabbalah books refer to God in terms of sun, energy. It's a hard thing to put your finger on. That's exactly the point. We're giving analogies, the most sublime analogies that we can give to relate to something that is sublime, the infinite, the infinite one. The analogies are here to bridge the gap between us, finite, to begin the journey to bridge towards infinity. Okay, so says the Balatanya. Let's go inside for a few minutes. The next page. The shame Havaya, what does Havaya mean? Existence. Yeah, but it means more than existence. Perushai. Shemahave es hakol. Havaya, Yudke Vavke. What's the root of Yudke Vavke? He, Vav, and He. He, Vav, and He is the root, which is Hove, which means existence. But existence means Shemahave. Yudke, Vavke means creator. But we'll see in a second what's, so what's the Yud doing there. We mentioned this today in Shir, in Gemara Shir. Shemahave esakol ma'ayin liyesh. Yudke Vavke means the one who is creating all of existence from nothingness to something. So what's the Yud there? Vehayud nishameshes es ha shehi baloshen hoive v'tamid. The Yud in the beginning of a word, I we mentioned this before, Yira. The Yud in the beginning of a word can describe the action of always doing something. Keperish Rashi, ala posik, a posik in Eoiv, Job. Look it up. Perak Aleph Hey. Kacha yase Eoiv. Kacha yaase Eoiv. Kolayamen. This is what Eoiv would always do. Yase means, with a yud at the beginning of the word, something that would always be done by Eoiv. So if God, if Yudke Vavke, the root of his hov, is Hove, to create, the creator, so then what does Yudke Vavke mean? The one who is always creating. The constant creator of existence. That's Yudke Vavke. To tap into the energy of non-stop creation, i.e. the creation of something from nothing which is different, remember we described this last chapter, which is different than any creation that you and I do, because how do we create something from something, which is the root, says the Balatanya, of those that make theological mistakes in thinking that Hashem is not involved in the world, because they think that the way that Hashem runs the world is something from something. Like just like when a person makes a silver goblet, he takes a bunch of silver and he molds the silver, and the goblet sits on the shelf, and then Mr. Goblet Maker could go to the shuk and buy some fish and chips and call it a day and then later that night go back to his workshop and find that the silver goblet is still sitting on the shelf and the silver goblet did not need constant input from his maker. So they say, oh, Hashem is the same. He made the world and then he left. You fools. Hashem doesn't make the world something from something. Hashem makes the world something from nothing. From nothing. And therefore, your 
perspective of God is erroneous, like Rabbi Nachman said, I don't believe in God. What, Rabbi? Yeah, the same God you don't believe in, I don't believe in Him either. Oh, so which God do you believe in? Let's talk about God. So God creates the world something from nothing. Yudke Vavke means God is the constant creator of the world, something from nothing. Something from absolute nothingness. Okay, let's proceed. Vahain Vachis Hanishba Bakol Rega Mamish, Yudke Vavke is tapping me into the power that Hashem is using to create the world every second, not even a second, you can't even call it a second, a nanosecond. Every, you can't even call it a moment. Every something from nothing, Bekola Bruim, every part of creation, including all the spiritual worlds, all the secret, wondrous worlds, all the angelic worlds, everything. Mimoitzi Pi Hashem Veruchoi, that Hashem is speaking it into existence, and we explain what it means to speak. Speak means to reveal that which is inside. Outwards, that's what it means, Hashem's speech. And Hashem is creating everything from nothing to something. Bakol Rega, every single moment. It's not that Hashem created the world in six days and then he left. Like they say, like the watchmaker. Hashem just wound up the watch and then he toodles and then he left. No! Hashem is constantly giving energy into existence. Now, if you tapped into that energy, that's Yud Kev okay, that's a big sun. That's like, that's a lot of energy. To feel God pumping your heart right now, to feel God animating existence, most people, they would just like either explode or be on the floor, Hashem Elohim, Hashem Elohim, or they'd run away to play more video games. Because it would just be like, oh, I, I can't, ha good thing I have Elohim blocking that. And apparently Sunday night football started last night. So we can distract ourselves further. Because that's a lot of light to be tapping into that level of existence. So, okay, give me some more Elohim. Because I, I, get me back to nature, you know, like, give me some more terra firma. Okay, yeah, Hashem blocked that reality. But by the way, the more that you learn Torah, the more that you're, you're removing Elohim. That's how the rabbis did all sorts of miracles, because they weren't run by nature anymore. Ein mazal Yisrael, which we'll talk about more. They started to go above. They started to remove the sun from the sheath. By the way, the process of learning Torah takes you above Elohim, which we saw last week that Avram Avinu, who could not have children, his wife, Sarah, did not have a womb. It's a bit hard to have children if your wife does not have the apparatus of literally housing a child. And Hashem says, Go out of your constellations. Ein mazali Yisrael. You're not bound by nature. If I say that your wife, Sarah, will have a child, Yitzchak, and will be given the bris, and will be given the inheritance to the land. Then it doesn't matter that your, your wife does not have a womb. She will have a child. And the next year she had a child. And that was Yitzchak. Our alta, 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 zayda. Baruch Hashem. Because Elohim is not the whole story. Elohim is just holding back Yudke Vavke. But the more you start learning, you start to go above the world of Elohim. So the Rebbe, just in summary, quoted the Pasuk from David HaMelech. David HaMelech said, Ki Shem Hashem Elohim. Hashem, you have a son, and the son has a sheath. And what's the son? The son is Yudke Vavke. What's the sheath? Elohim. And Hashem, in the time to come, you're going to remove the sun from its sheath, i.e. that the truth that you are the creator, sustainer every second will fill the world and the righteous will be healed from this. They will be invigorated from this truth and the wicked will be, it won't be good because they'll, they'll 
meet reality. And if they were rebelling against reality, then they won't be able to handle that level of truth. And then we started to describe, so what is Yudke Vavke? Yudke Vavke is hove, that you're mehave, Hashem, you constantly create, and the Yud at the beginning means constantly. All you do is create the world something from nothing. And we're going to see tomorrow that that's the ultimate act of giving and chesed, which is going to be a defining feature of Hashem, is that Hashem is a giver. Hashem gives and gives and gives. And one of the ways that we're going to learn to tap into Yud Kei Vav Kei is to become great givers. To become like our great Zaydi Avram, who was a fanatic. You know what he's a fanatic for? Loving kindness. Helping. Helping humanity. Everybody. And just teaching the world about Hashem. Educating. Loving human beings being the biggest giver possible. Come into my house, I will just feed you. Do I have to pay? Pay me. Thank the one who made all the food. We should be zoich mamish to go in the ways of Avram Avinu, Yitzchok and Yaakov, to be zoich the Mashiach, and binyin beis hamikdash, b'mher of yameinu, amen. Have a wonderful day, my friends. Thank you, Zaydi, for joining us. So wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you. Hatzlacha. Thank you for being in the yeshiva. It means so much to us. Thank you. And thank you for sharing Sam with us. We're so proud of him. Great.